Um, so we're uh, we're going to continue uh, talking about prokaryotic cells here. There's no quiz today. It's a good thing. Um, so page 66. And uh, let me know if you have any questions about the reading that you did. That's the wrong. Enable content. Who's that guy? Hey, nice. What did he do? Scrub the cell. Nice. Good job. No and stuff. Okay, so let's look at the parts of a bacterium. Should I turn this out? Would that be better? Is that better or not? I like it out. Raise your hand if you like it better like that. I like that. Okay, that gets the vote. Sorry. Um. <coughs> Okay, so this is a little uh, a little prokaryotic cell. Um, bacteria is another word that's kind of thrown around, meaning a prokaryotic cell. But there are uh, there are other types of cells other than bacteria that are prokaryotic. Prokaryotic means before the nucleus. So this cell doesn't really have a nucleus. A nucleus is a container in the middle of the cell that holds the DNA. And this cell doesn't really have one. It has DNA just floating around in the middle of it, but it's not contained within a membrane. It's just kind of sitting there floating around. That's this stuff right here. Um, so look at the lines are off a little bit. Is it that way in your book? Mm, nope. nope. Huh. Anyway, so you have DNA floating around in the middle. We call that the nucleoid. Um, on the very outside, you have all these hairs. These little hairs are called fimbriae, and they help this cell stick to things. Bacteria can stick to things pretty easily, and those little hairs help them, help them stick into things, kind of hang on. So they're stuck to the wall, like I said, they're stuck to your skin. They stick on the floor and the sides of your sink, and they're all over the place. And then underneath that, there's this jelly-like layer. We call it the glycocalyx. And um, it, it's also called, it can be called a capsule or a slime layer, this, this kind of thick layer on the outside. And it does, it has a protective function. It'll protect this um, cell from harm. It'll uh, protect it from uh, harmful chemicals. Um, for instance, penicillin is a drug that you take to kill these things. And often they have a, such a thick slime layer or capsule that the penicillin doesn't hurt them. They're protected from the drug. A lot of these organisms evolved this after people started taking penicillin for all their sicknesses. These things changed and evolved and came up with a slime layer to protect, protect them from the penicillin. Isn't that interesting? So now penicillin doesn't work on most infections. Hmm. And they've come up with other drugs that do work. Um, but they, these things will slowly form um, evolutional mutations and such to resist those other drugs too. So we're going to have to keep finding new drugs to kill these infections um, as time goes on. Oh, this flagellum at the bottom that helps these things swim around. Not all of these prokaryotes have it, but some of them. 
They can swim around in the water and stuff. And this red layer is called the cell wall. The cell wall kind of makes, is, is a tough layer that, it's kind of, I like to describe it as kind of like a chain link fence. A chain link fence is, is tough, but it also can let stuff through because it's got holes in it. And that's kind of what the cell wall is like. It's, uh, it's tough but strong. I mean, it's tough but porous. Stuff can go through. And then this little thin layer here, the plasma membrane, it's very thin, but it's, uh, it's what we call semi-permeable. It'll let some stuff in, but not everything. And it's more like kind of like a, pla a, a piece of plastic, uh, uh, saran wrap, you know that stuff? If you're going to make a model of a cell, you probably have this pla plasma membrane being saran wrap with little tiny holes in it that some stuff can go through. We call that the plasma membrane. What did you say? It's semi? Semi-permeable. Permeable means let stuff through. Semi means sort of. Semi-permeable. And so there's basically three layers protecting this thing. And then inside of the cell, there are these all these little dots you see, they're called ribosomes. And they're where proteins are made. We're going to learn about how the cell makes proteins. And often this plasma membrane will pinch inward and form what we call a mesosome where it's kind of, the, uh, l the outer layer kind of goes inward. And what that does is it increases the surface area of the cell. It makes it so there's more surface. And so you can see, if this just went straight across, it would have less surface. But it pinches inward and gives more membrane surface. And when you have a bunch of these things, you can pull things in and push things out a lot you have a lot more surface to do it. We talked about surface area last time. The inclusion body, sometimes this little thing will break off completely and then you'll have a little bubble floating around inside the cell. We call that an inclusion body, a bubble of material inside the cell. Oh, the conjugation pillus. That's a little, that's, that's the uh, sexual structure of the bacteria. Did you know bacteria have sex? Bacteria sex. One will come up to another one and stick its conjugation pillus in the next bacterium and then squirt a little bit of DNA through the conjugation pillus. And then so they trade information. So these things have a form of intercourse. Isn't that gross? <laughs> so, Look, it's got a couple of them. Every bacterium has this, so they can stick each other. <laughs> kind of dirty, isn't it? Questions about any of these parts? This is the simplest organism we know, and the smallest, that can live on its own. Viruses are smaller, but they can't really live on their own. What, what part of the cell is that? The conjugation pillars? It's not quite like sex, like you think of uh, sexual reproduction like a lot of organisms have. We're going to get into sexual reproduction. That's one thing you get to do a lot in biology, you study sexual reproduction. So you're going to have to get used to that. Questions? Mm -hmm. Anything? Well, maybe. Yes. So what part of that makes you sick? <laughs> or is that just... Nothing specific. Well, that, that's a good question. I mean, these things, as they multiply, they'll eat. They'll, they get. They have to get food to mm -hmm. to get more stuff in them. So that's yeah. what they do. As they're multiplying, they're eating mm -hmm. you up. They're that's eating it. your cells and destroying them. And often they give off toxic waste products mm -hmm. that, as a waste. So just yeah. them squirting out their waste. That waste is poisonous to you. So mm -hmm. as these things multiply, they eat up your body and they give off these toxic waste products that might be poisonous to you. I see. And that's how you die of an infection.
That's gross. Yeah, they're just inside. They're just trying to live. They don't know where they are or anything. They're just eating what's in their surroundings. So if you cut yourself and you get some of these in the cut and they take hold and multiply, you, you're in trouble. You've got an infection. And you have a whole system called the immune system that we're going to study that fights infections. you got little cells of your own crawling around eating these things whenever they find them. But sometimes these things, these things can overwhelm your your body systems and then you're in trouble. Nowadays we just take antibiotics and usually the antibiotics will, often the antibiotics will kill them. But there are some out there that are immune to all the antibiotics. And then if you get those, either your immune system kills it or you die. And it's usually, you know, most of the time you get over it, but some of the time you die. It used to be, back before uh, antibiotics, about half of people died from infections. Like before the age of 20, usually when you're a kid. So if what families would do, they'd have eight kids and four of them would die from infections and the other four would live and grow up. Hmm. And that was just, death was just part of it. He never got too attached to anybody because people were dying all the time. I mean, the average lifespan back then was like 40. It's a whole different, it was a whole different world just a hundred years ago. Uh, we're not gonna watch that. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about eukaryotic cells, which start on page 67. Oh, this shows the uh, the membrane. Now I'll talk more about that. So a eukaryotic cell is a cell that's a lot more involved, that has a lot more stuff to it. And this part on page 67 shows how the eukaryotic cell came about. There was some original prokaryotic cell, kind of like the one I just showed you, but maybe more blob-like. And if you think about the, the membrane of the cell does something that's called invaginating. And I know that sounds kind of dirty there. But <laughs> invaginating is when the, the outside of the cell kind of, kind of dips inward and forms a little pocket. Like imagine the outside of the cell here has come inward to form a little pocket. And, and that's a little inclusion body. Uh, we call that an invagination of the cell membrane. And if you could imagine this, this little pocket just surrounding the DNA, this pocket comes in and, and lengthens and surrounds the DNA. Then you have your DNA in the middle surrounded by a membrane. And that's what we see in a, in a, in a eukaryotic cell. A eukaryotic cell has what we call a nucleus. DNA in the middle surrounded by a membrane. And in a eukaryotic cell, you also have another bunch of membranous sacs. All these little things here are little membrane pockets that have come in and broken off and formed what we call an endomembrane system. A system of membranes inside the cell that can have functions. And we're going to talk about all those functions over the next couple of days. And all that comes from invagination. Isn't that a great word? Invagination. Let's say it on three. One, two, three. Invagination. <laughs> Y'all are embarrassed to say it. Don't say invagination. That's not pretty. You can say vagina. It's kind of dirty. Can you go back real quick? Okay. This is all in your book on page 67. Yeah, I know. I just You can go on. I go kind of fast, sorry. There are other little prokaryotic cells, bacteria, that get taken into the cell. That little thing that looks like a bean there, that's called a mitochondrion, and that's an organelle inside your cells. 
And it used to be a free living organism. And it gets taken into the cell. There's a name for this, it's called endosymbiosis. That's a word that's not dirty, you can say. On three, endosymbiosis. One, two, three. Endosymbiosis. Nice. It's a great word. That means living together. Endosymbiosis. Taking in another living organism, so now you're living together. And so these cells are, I mean, this was once free living, but now it lives inside the cell and it helps um, distribute energy in the cell. And so it's very important that little, uh, that little symbiosis, uh, uh, symbiosis means living together. So. Later, some of the cells even gained what we call chloroplasts, which were once free-living photosynthetic bacteria. Photosynthesis means making your own food. And these things could make their own food. And then well, now, that if once they're living inside a cell, the cell can make its own food. And, and every plant in the world came from this type of cell. So, we have these cells that didn't take in photosynthetic bacteria went on to be animals, and these cells that did take in photosynthetic bacteria went on to be plants. Yeah, there we go. So nowadays we have animal cells and we have plant cells, but they all originally came from these prokaryotic simpler cells. They kind of evolved to live together. This whole process, going from the original prokaryotic cell to the animal and plant cells that we have today, took about two and a half billion years. The Earth is a very, very old place. I don't know if you know this. 4.5 billion years old. And that number is just hard for anyone to imagine. Isn't that a neat process? That's the uh, endosymbiosis process. Questions about that? You can ask a question. So for this chapter, is now like a lot of vocabulary? A ton. It's got a ton of vocabulary. Learning all, what we're going to do next is learn all the parts of this cell. Can you explain endosymbiosis? Yeah, that's, that's taking in, see how these other organisms, this was once living on its own, and then it's pulled in. It's like you taking a guy off the street and pulling him into your house, and now he's in your house. And if you take a bunch of guys off the street, then you got a bunch of guys in your house there. And But they help your house. They clean up a little bit, actually. It's like, oh, wait, it's nice having this guy in here. I'll keep him in here. And they're still in the cells today. That's in oh, the so that, like, there's no such thing as just this cell anymore? Yeah, these cells do not exist on their own anymore. They only exist inside cells. Aerobic bacteria? What? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, no, there are other types of aerobic bacteria that exist on their own out here. But these types only exist inside cells. But the other, those cells can exist by themselves. The these cell. things? The other big thing, the cell. This? The other thing. This? Yeah. Well... Yeah, it did. It did exist by itself, and, and there's probably still some like this that did exist by that still exist by themselves. But there's also some like this that have pulled these in and now are more complicated, more complex, and they live by themselves now too. See, this is a change. We're changing over time. Now we have these more complex, complicated cells that have come from simpler cells. What's the difference like? Do we have any simple cells, or do we have all only complex cells? Like, like in our body or in the world, which are you asking? In our body. Our body are all complex cells. What about, like what's the example of a simple cell? A, 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 a prokaryote, all these uh, 
bacteria that we were that I was showing you earlier, these are simple cells. What do they do? They live everywhere. You know, anything you might get a, a, a disease from, those are from these types of cells. They're all over your skin, they're all over the ground, they're floating around in the air, they're everywhere. They're the majority of life on Earth. They're so small you can't really see them. And they're very simple, and this is all they really have. But a, a bunch of these, some of these evolved into the more complicated cells that make up our bodies and the bodies of plants and animals. And so that's what I was just showing here is how that how those original free living cells came to form these more complicated cells. Does that make sense? I don't know if I answered your question. Endosymbiosis. 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 That's the cell. That's how cells became more complicated and came to, to living together to form more complicated cells. Let's see what this is. Most modal bacteria move by means of flagellum. A flagellum is a slender structure about 15 to 20 microns long and about 20 nanometers wide. A typical rod-shaped bacterial cell. Okay, we got problems there. See if this one the works. eukaryotic internal membrane system, called the endoplasmic reticulum, and the nuclear envelope may have evolved from infoldings of the plasma membrane in an ancestral prokaryotic cell. Such infoldings are common in modern prokaryotic cells. The theory of endosymbiosis proposes that a critical stage in the evolution of eukaryotic cells involved endosymbiotic relationships with prokaryotic organisms. Microorganisms that live within other cells and perform specific functions for their host cells are called endosymbionts. According to the theory, energy-producing bacteria may have been engulfed by a larger primitive cell and come to reside within it, eventually evolving into what we now know as mitochondria. Photosynthetic bacteria use photosynthetic pigments embedded in internal membranes to derive energy from sunlight. These bacteria may have come to live within early eukaryotic cells, leading to the evolution of chloroplasts. Several facts provide evidence for the endosymbiotic hypothesis. A few examples include, one, mitochondria and chloroplast. Okay, so did you see that? That's kind of showing how this original cell, that's really simple, changed over time to take in stuff to become more complicated. Hmm. Yeah? Are the plasma membrane folds, are they just like mesosomes? Yeah, these are just, these are like mesosomes, but they're going to have a different name now when we get to eukaryotic cells. They're called endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi complexes. What's the difference? There's not really much difference. There's, it's, it's, just because it's, in it's more advanced, yeah, it's because it's in a eukaryotic cell. So we know that these things were once free living bacterium, for several reasons, and that's what the next thing that she was going to go into. One, you find DNA in these things, and in these things, there's uh, there's DNA in there. It's like it has it has its own instructions. And both of those things will multiply, just like bacteria will multiply. They'll copy themselves. So these things will copy themselves, and they actually move around inside the cell. They kind of swim around inside the cell. So they were obviously once free living on their own. And now they live inside the cell. And they say they're also about the same size as bacteria. These things are about the same size as bacteria. So, all right. 
So wow, look at all these parts of the eukaryotic cell you have to know. Page 68 and 69. We need to know all this? Yeah, we're going to have to know all this. So this is a plant cell, and this is an animal cell. And the rest of this chapter is just going over all these different parts. So there's a lot of words here. Are you ready? No one's ready? Ready. Yeah, we got one person ready. Ready. Let me uh, let me start with the um, outer membrane, which I kind of missed last time. The cell membrane, the outside of the cell, is made of these special molecules. They're called phospholipids. Phospholipids. Do y'all remember we actually learned about phospholipids last chapter? Y'all remember those? Let's take a look at what a phospholipid is. Do y'all remember what a fat looked like? You took something, and Isaac, if you could kind of point this uh -huh. over here. Yeah, glycerol like attached to a phosphate. It's a glycerol. A glycerol attached to fatty acid chains. Do you remember these? And if we take one fatty acid chain that's a little bit bent, and we remove one of the fatty acid chains, and then we attach a couple of extra molecules to the top part, click, click, we've got a molecule here called a phospholipid. And that is what this is. See this little thing with the two tails? It's a fat molecule, basically. And the cell membrane is made up of billions of them. And they're just, they line up in a certain way like this. It's a double layer, and we learn next chapter why they line up like that. And these big globs, these big brown things that are in the membrane are proteins. Remember the protein, the chain of amino acids that kind of folds up into a final shape? That's this thing. And so that's what the, the, the membrane of all cells are. A phospholipid bilayer with proteins in it. Basically, all of your cells have, have a fat membrane, fatty membrane around them. So you're always going to have some fat in you. And it's important to have fat because it makes up every cell's membrane. Most people's body is about 10 to 25% fat. So you have this outer membrane here that's uh, this fatty layer. That's this outer part right here. And every membrane that's in the cell is made of the same stuff. So you see this little line here? That's a membrane. It's, it's made of the same stuff that this is. It formed by by invagination of the membrane. And all this stuff here, that's all membrane too, and so is this stuff. And the membrane that surrounds the nucleus is all that stuff too. So this membrane stuff is everywhere. All over the cell. And so they're showing it, kind of showing it up close here. The proteins that are in the membrane help let stuff in and out and have a lot of other functions, too. Let's talk about this nuclear membrane, or they call it nuclear envelope. 
That's a membrane around the nucleus of the cell. Wasn't the wasn't the envelope containing the, uh, the cell wall the um, plasma membrane and the the, light, the slime layer or whatever capsule? Okay, you had your slime layer on the very outside. Yeah. Underneath that, you have your cell wall. Yeah. Underneath that, you have the cell membrane. Okay. Now, these things don't have a cell wall or a slime layer. It's hard to see around him. These things only have a plasma membrane or a cell membrane. They don't have a slime layer or a cell wall. The bacteria we learned about have a slime layer and a cell wall. These things have a slime layer and a cell wall, and there's the membrane underneath it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Animal cells don't have that slime layer and cell wall. Every cell in your body just has the membrane. So here we go, here's the nucleus of a cell, and looking up close at it, you can see there's the uh, membrane around it, and those little holes there are called nuclear pores. Nuclear pores are holes that let stuff in and out of the nucleus. And it's important to have these holes so things can go in and out. And these are proteins that form a little circle that form a nice little hole so you can get stuff in and out of the nucleus. The nuclear membrane is a double membrane. It's got a, a layer on the inside and a layer on the outside. We say that's a double membrane. Two layers of membrane that protect the inside. Guess what's inside the nucleus? It's a molecule we already studied. DNA. DNA. The instructions. It's like a library of information in there. And you don't you, you want to really protect the library. You don't want that information just to go anywhere. You got to protect it. So there's a double layer of membrane and there are these holes that are kind of guarded actually. Only certain things can get in and out there. This is what it really looks like through an electron microscope. Those are the holes? Is Those that... are the holes. See all the holes? Oh, wow. The electron microscope pictures they have are amazing. But this is what it, they, they see under the microscope, and this is what the artist's drawing of it is, if you could actually get that close. Let's see a little fun video on the nucleus. Inside the cell membrane, there are many different structures called organelles, which literally means little organs. One organelle, the nucleus, is the control center of the cell. The nucleus has a membrane that has pores in it. These allow certain molecules to enter or leave the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, there is fiber-like material called chromosomes. Chromosomes contain the cell's genetic information. This genetic information is like an architect's blueprint that determines how wood, glass, and other materials are used to build a house. The genetic blueprint in a person's chromosomes determines how different proteins are put together. These proteins are responsible for physical features, such as the color of a person's hair and eyes, the shape of her nose, and even whether she is susceptible to certain kinds of diseases. Yay, nucleus. Did y'all learn about the cell in middle school? Not really. <laughs> Okay. Now, 
the next thing that's discussed in the book are ribosomes. Ribosomes, let's go back. You see all these little yellow dots? They're called ribosomes. And ribosomes are organelles that make protein in a cell. You remember what protein is? You already had a test on it. Yeah, a protein is a long chain of amino acids. Russell, you with me? I'm with you. What is this? That is a ribosome. Oh, sorry, sorry, that's a protein. protein. It is a protein. Protein's a long chain of amino acids that eventually folds into its final shape. And there's your protein. And this protein has to be made somewhere. It has to be put together somewhere. What makes it? What puts all these little amino acids in the correct order? DNA. The ribosome. The ribosome are these little yellow dots. And every one of them is a little factory that's making proteins. And it's constantly happening inside your cells. And it uses the instructions from the DNA to, the, the DNA tells the ribosome what order to put these in. Like the DNA instructions, the DNA instructions that are in the nucleus will be copied. The instructions will be copied and will go out the, the little uh, pore here, the nuclear pore, and will go to one of the ribosomes and it will say, hey, ribosome, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put five white am amino acids first, and then two pink ones, and then a white one, and then a blue one, and then a green one, and then an orange one, then four more white ones, then three more blue ones. How long? What if I went on forever? How long could I go on until somebody stopped me and said, is he having a stroke? <laughs> um, you could just go on and on until all these are in the correct order so that they fold into the correct protein that's needed. That's the job of the ribosome, to let that protein be put together correctly. And so they show that here. Here's the DNA in the nucleus. Do you remember DNA kind of looks like a double helix, a ladder? Did I show you all that? Mm -hmm. And the DNA gets the instructions. That's the instructions for making proteins. It gets copied. And this, this purple line is the copy of the DNA. So we copy the DNA into a little, this purple thing. It's called RNA, mRNA. That goes out of the nucleus, out through the little nuclear pore out to the ribosome, and there's the ribosome sitting there. And the ribosome will take that information, and you can see the little beads being put on the string. And this protein will kind of fall out of the ribosome. So the yellow dot is the ribosome there. So the DNA is telling the ribosome how to put together a protein. So it takes the DNA the nucleus. It doesn't. The DNA stays in the nucleus, but a copy of the DNA leaves the nucleus. Which is the purple thing. The, which is called RNA. RNA are DNA copies. Imagine a library that you go in, but you aren't allowed to check out any books. Because the books are really old and they're well guarded. It's like the Library of Congress. <laughs> well, what if there's information in those books that you want? What do you do? Copy. You just copy it. You photocopy it, or you write it down. You open the book. You photocopy a couple pages, and then you can take the pages with you out of the library. You see, and we, and so we don't wreck the original copy. The, in the nucleus are all the original copies, and you, you want to protect those. You don't want to mess with those. So you just copy them. You leave the library, and then let's say in, let's say this entire library has instructions for making things. You take the instructions to the factory, and in the factory they read the instructions and they build the thing. 
The factory is like the ribosome. Do you see? What happens to the RNA after it leaves the ribosome? The RNA leaves the ribosome and it can make it can go to another ribosome and make another protein, or it can be degraded by special enzymes in the cytoplasm. Special enzymes floating around out here can eat up and destroy it. But usually what it'll do is it'll go to another ribosome and it'll make the same protein over and over and over. You usually need hundreds or thousands of proteins, not just a couple. Yes. So how does the nucleus know to send out an RNA or anything like that? Does it think or? <laughs> it doesn't. It's, it's kind of automatic. And, mm -hmm. and that's one of the great mysteries of science is how it knows to do all this. It's, it, we learn about it in chapter 15, how the DNA controls when it mm -hmm. is copied and when it's not. I see. There's, a, oh, there's two chapters on it. It's, it's pretty right. amazing, and they're just unlocking those secrets now. I see. Huh? But it's, it's kind of automatic. It happens without thinking. It mm -hmm. happens when, it, when, it, when a protein is needed, there's a chain reaction of things that happens that cause that to, to be made. It's really some cool stuff. How are y'all doing? I know it's, 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 it's a lot, I know. Sometimes when I get tired, what I'll do is I'll slap myself real hard. <laughs> and I feel better. <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed. I'm in pain up here. I'm doing this for y'all. So look, here we go. So we continue making this uh, this just kind of goes through all the steps. I tell you what, don't worry about these steps, one, two, three, and what it's saying here. We spent a whole chapter learning these steps later. This is just showing how a protein gets made. This protein that's made is being dumped into this area here. This is a big area inside the cell called the ER, or endoplasmic reticulum. And that's what we're going to look at next. So don't waste your time now memorizing these steps, one, two, three, four, five. Have a whole chapter on it later. Y'all see that on the bottom of 71? So these ribosomes, that's what's next. It's on page 72. These ribosomes, these little yellow dots, are found attached to this layer of membrane called the endoplasmic reticulum. It's a bunch of folded membrane inside the cell, and it's got these little ribosomes stuck to it. And so when a ribosome, when a little yellow dot makes a protein, it squirts it into this area, this open area here, what we call the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. And that endoplasmic reticulum accepts the proteins that are made and can move them around, can move them from place to place. The endoplasmic reticulum is like a storage area and a transport area. And can move stuff around. There are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. Rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes all over it. And smooth endoplasmic reticulum doesn't have ribosomes on it. It's a, it's a network of membrane without ribosomes. So, we got your rough ER and your smooth ER, is what we call it. The smooth ER makes fats. The rough ER is where proteins are made, because that's where the ribosomes are. So all these fat molecules, they get put together in the smooth ER. And all your protein molecules get put together in the rough ER by the ribosomes. We don't get in, 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 in this regular biology class, we don't get into how the fats are made. 
There are special enzymes that do it, but that's college level stuff. I mean, we're at college level, but later college level. Junior, senior, college level stuff. They'll talk about how the fats are put together. Endoplasmic reticulum video, and then we're done. Some of the organelles are called endoplasmic reticulum. Among other things, endoplasmic reticulum serve as the cell's assembly lines because they are where protein products are put together based on instructions from the nucleus. The endoplasmic reticulum serve other functions as well. They're like highways that provide a transportation network. Among other things, they connect different organelles in a cell and allow them to exchange materials. That was pretty lame. Okay, you read 4.3 and 4.4, which talks about the nucleus and the ribosomes. And come and see me if, you're, uh, if this stuff is overwhelming you. So, Sir, I cut it and then. Yeah,